So good morning, good afternoon, good day for everyone on the 13th of Friday of in uh, COVID 2020. Um, fingers crossed and touching wood everywhere that uh, everyone is having a healthy and successful day uh, through this uh, in terms of the backdrop of uh, the chaos and the pandemic that's going on with the changing circumstances, sometimes hourly, sometimes daily. Um, Welcome to the second report here. So Michael, why don't you say hello and as uh, one of the other principal author authors, and then we'll turn it over to Joelle for the presentation. Uh, certainly. So hi, uh, I'm Mike Barber from Toro University, California, and I'm in um, Vacaville, although the university is in lovely Vallejo. And I'm happy to be working with Randy and Joelle on uh, this project um, to give you a little backstory. Um, it was actually germinated as Randy and I were uh, essentially trying to understand how we were going to pull apart uh, the State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada report uh, that we do annually and how we would figure out a way in which to accommodate what happened in the spring. And um, our decision at the time was to essentially set up this series of um, separate reports so that we could differentiate the remote instruction that was taking place compared to the traditional distance online and blended that was taking place. And uh, we were directed to Joelle as a potential collaborator and uh, she has been exceptional to work with. Uh, she's actually, as you note on all of the reports, the lead author on all of them because she's done the uh, uh, the vast majority of work on all of these reports. So are both mine and Randy's hats off to Joelle because without her, these wouldn't exist at this point. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Joelle to talk about our second report now. Awesome, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. So I'm just going to share my screen for you. So we'll be talking about um, what was happening during the reopening of schools this fall. And just to let you know, um, we'll go through the data that we've prepared in the report um, and then have our discussion afterwards. But by all means, if you have any questions that you would um, or comments that you'd like to put in the chat, um, Randy and Michael can moderate that during the presentation. So just to kind of um, situate the reopening of schools within um, the COVID environment across Canada. So you can see here that between September 1st and September 15th, um, the numbers across um, the provinces was, you know, some a little bit fluctuating, but slowly increasing. And now that we were into November, um, seeing a lot of different numbers and spikes across, across Canada. So lots of different kinds of um, tension and stress and controversy about opening schools and such. Um, but in the end, all of our jurisdictions um, had different plans for um, starting. So most of the jurisdictions, as you see here, had no delay in opening. Um, British Columbia had a two day delay because at that time their numbers were kind of starting to rise and they needed to kind of um, think about what that implication was for starting. Saskatchewan, as you can see here also was delayed and then Ontario as well. And um, it was sort of, um, Ontario had a kind of a, a late, um, for their delay because they, for what they were allowed to do from the ministry in terms of going to quad masters for high school and allowing students to be, be home and such, um, once they were given the go ahead that they could delay, um, that was an important part of their process. And then once um, the classes started, they did start staggered by grade level for in-class learning. So there were various learning options that um, uh, happened across the jurisdictions. All of the jurisdictions opened fully, but some had some different um, considerations that they noted um, for online learning. So here we have 
Most of the classes were online. There was distance options for most, but then some jurisdictions offered some more detail about how that online learning or remote learning kind of um, manifested. So for example, Saskatchewan, you know, specifically spoke about using Google Classroom and how they wanted there to be um, a time minimum that they would um, use with their stu students, as well as a synchronous, um, asynchronous blend. For Ontario, there was also, it was fully um, in class for grades seven and eight. Um, for grades, um, for high school, for secondary, they could go to um, cohorting. For example, in the quad master, you would have 15 students in class at a time and then 15 students at home online. Um, and then they would switch it every two weeks. However, during that kind of model, you have teachers that are both attending to the in-class and online learning at the same time. And in the, the Toronto area, there was also um, a lot of difficulty getting um, the boards with the ministry to decide what could they actually do with their students. Um, and in those areas too, teachers did end up being responsible for both the, syn um, the synchronous learning of their online students as well as their in-class students. Um, and then you can see here um, for New Brunswick, they offered remote paper-based packages for their younger grades, as well as attending to um, their older grades with a blend of synchronous, asynchronous for high school. And then some learning options were never specified on the ministry websites or in anything that I could find. Um, and it's also important to note that a lot of what happened during this time of reopening is very community specific and very board specific or district specific. So that the ministries would kind of put out general um, information about what um, boards and districts were allowed to do, but it really did manifest in different ways based on community needs. So again, um, the territories were also fully in class. And as their numbers were um, zero at the point of restarting, um, it's not um, you know, hard to think that they really didn't kind of think about you know, different learning options and such because um, they were feeling very confident about being able to send their students to school. So for Across Canada, for all the jurisdictions, there are a lot of different um, policies, I suppose, for, for masks, not masks, what age or grade level you would introduce the masks and, and cohorting and bubbling. So for example, British Columbia, masks were not mandatory at the time and you have very small um, learning groups and then those learning groups could kind of um, gather with other groups, but uh, never more of 60 and class size never um, specified. Class sizes across were usually not specified um, except for Alberta that had their cap of 20 students in kindergarten. And most of the, the jurisdictions um, with their, their masks mandates, if they had them, um, it was that if they weren't wearing them in the classroom, then if there were areas where they couldn't social distance, then that's when they would have to be wearing masks. So a lot of the lower grades, the younger grades, um, four and, and younger, um, didn't have to wear masks. So the trend was typically for junior um, intermediate needing to have masks in elementary schools, and then the high schools also had to wear masks. Some um, jurisdictions or, for example, Quebec, um, the students needed to wear masks outside of their classrooms, but within the classrooms, then they could take them off as long as they were with their bubble. And so it was very important then that the cohort stayed together and didn't um, um, associate with any other bubbles. So again, Nova Scotia class sizes not specified as well as PEI and Newfoundland and Lab Labrador, but they are um, having some level of policy for wearing masks. 
And then of course, uh, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Yukon, um, again, because they had no active cases at the time, masks were not mandatory, but there were, um, you know, attempts to have social distancing and still attend to and be mindful of um, the health um, concerns. So it was also really important to think about what remote learning resources um, were offered or um, attended to from the ministries. Um, from the report in the spring, most jurisdictions within a couple of weeks had their websites up and ready. They had policies for distributing technology. And there was a lot of conversation about how to get students um, in this remote learning um, model to have access to learning in this way. But for the new school year, there was a lot of um, really non-specification of technology anymore. Um, no direction towards the, the websites that were created for the spring. Places like Saskatchewan did have their online learning center to off, offer courses for um, support. And Manitoba also was still um, distributing devices to students in need. As well as in Ontario, boards continued to um, deliver technology to the students that still needed it, who were choosing their online option. Um, and other places like Quebec, um, they were still continuing with their French language television and offering educational videos that way for the students in remote learning. And New Brunswick also offered to um, deliver devices. But then again, um, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island at the ministry level, there was no specification about identifying specific learning resources for students who chose to be at home. Um, for Newfoundland and Labrador, um, they were more detailed in that they had technology available. Um, they were reserving a lot of those uh, technology pieces for grade 12 students as they were going to, to need that to graduate but as well offering their, their own MiFi broadband um, to the districts in need. Because of course, um, as was highlighted during the spring, there were a lot of areas that um, did not have access to um, the internet or internet services, or it was expensive and such. Um, and those kind of ideas were, were addressed, but not in the same ways in the fall. And then of course, um, remote learning resources in the territories was not specified, but there was still a lot of emphasis for students who were remote to be um, thinking about working off the land. And those sort of, um, as we call in literacy, the, fun, the funds of knowledge kind of aspects that you are on the land, you are engaging in community um, learning and resources, and that was still um, very much highlighted. So just to kind of think of um, about a summary for this. So masks were required by most students, particularly in junior, um, intermediate, and then, and then secondary schools. And then if they were allowed to have them off during classroom, in their classroom or their, bu their bubble, if there were places um, walking around the school or going outside where events were happening with larger bubbles together, then they would need to wear their, their masks since social distancing was not possible. So again, the re for remote learning, few districts um, and jurisdictions really kind of offered any approaches that were new, um, even though um, there was that, that summer time to kind of think about what we needed to do to move towards the fall. Um, and it seemed more that um, the jurisdictions were, were moving towards the way that it, it was before the, the spring shutdown and that schools would be fully um, attended and up and running. Um, for those um, for high schools, the quad masters were in, introduced in some districts so that there could be lower number of students in class as well as the blend of learning um, remotely. And then of course, there were a lot of instances um, within this model where teachers were attending to both the in-class and the online um, learning of their students simultaneously. Um, 
in Ontario, for example, for elementary school, they were able to kind of second teachers out of the classroom to be specifically um, allocated towards students in online learning, but that um, wasn't um, always available in other jurisdictions. So for our future research, actually, I'm going to um, let Randy perhaps talk about um, what's coming up next. Randy, would you like to talk about what the next um, I'll stop talking to myself. report is going to be? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize awesome, I didn't no have problem. the mic. It's yeah, rookie mistakes, right? Um, just the uh, Tony Bates also blogged about his impressions about the the report. So he goes a little deeper in terms of actually bringing an editorial view to it, uh, and I think it's worth a read if you haven't seen it uh, as well. To check out Tony's blog post there in the in the chat as well, and we'll put a link to it on the main website where we are hosting everything. Uh, it's a Google site because. Part of the reason is we're in the midst of uh, launching a new Candy Learn website, so we put a temporary piece together. But we will be definitely having this uh, the reports posted on the Candy Learn website that will remain there for access. Where this Google site will likely fade into the distance after its use, useful life at this point uh, was there. Um, but also an invitation to those of you here that want to maybe contribute a little bit to this uh, research as well. It's not really uh, anything more than just the voices from folks that are actually experiencing it. So it's a lot more of the stories of what is actually happening, the successes, some of the challenges, the angst, uh, because as we know, it's a very, a very dynamic and, and moving situation that is occurring in our K-12 schools. And we started our discussion before we the presentation uh, about the fact that we hear a lot about uh, you know the the fact that there might be outbreaks uh, that might be in the schools but there's no little or no transmission in the schools is what we're told a lot about and uh, there's uh, I know in, on the media and the radio the health minister was being pinned in British Columbia about the fact that uh, even about the notion about role modeling is that you know we should be wearing masks out in any businesses or outdoors or in workplaces, uh, why is it that uh, with the students in a school that in some cases there is the option not to wear a mask or they don't have to when they're in their cohort groups? And is that uh, maybe, you know, medically speaking, maybe there isn't transmission, maybe there, there might be potential, but the question also comes back about role modeling. So there's a lot of complex issues that are going around and every single province, when they talk about stages, they're always slightly nuanced and different uh, that are occurring. So comparisons across the provinces are problematic and also comparing how the public health officers in each of the provinces are managing uh, within that uh, are different. And some of it comes in messaging. So the stories I think are what's important. And uh, I know that for contact tracing until it became a story about an individual who went to a spin class in Toronto uh, we've probably all heard that story about the number of people that were affected, the number that went into isolation, the number that couldn't go to work, the number of students that couldn't go to schools uh, are the consequences of some of the actions. So the stories tell it much better than the numbers do. So we're looking to a little bit of the stories from within the school. And we actually are looking for some of those successes because there's some things that we're learning now in this time that certainly are affecting for the students as well as ourselves as educators that we can carry forward. So out of the pandemic, we're certainly hopeful that we have uh, something new moved uh, and move the needle a little further in terms of how we can better engage and connect and, and create learning uh, through some of the, the, the things that have been forced upon us in the schools some of the, the structures which need to be reworked at. And Joelle, you mentioned about quadmesters and there's some strengths in that, there's some limitations in that. So it really is a great opportunity for us to really chronicle what's going on in schools in K to 12 right now so that we can learn from it. So invite your voice if you want to, you can certainly email um, your interest and we can give you a little bit more information. Uh, and you can do email me or also Michael or uh, Joelle, but uh, 
there's my email. Uh, Michael, do you want to, while we're still recording, add anything more uh, about this as well? Well, I guess the only thing I would add is the fact that the first two reports were really designed to chronicle what, based upon the information that was publicly available, what did the ministries and others that had authority over education intend to happen? What I think these narratives are designed to do is to provide a little bit more of a sense as to what actually happened from a variety of perspectives. You know, we're soliciting these from students, from parents, from teachers, from school leaders, from district leaders. Um, and, you know, really, you know, what went well, what didn't go so well, what are we still challenged with right now that we need to um, continue to, to, you know, focus upon? Because I think the reality with this, and one of the reasons why we're spending so much time focusing upon this research is, um, I remember sitting through one of the briefings that uh, Teresa Tam did back in, it was late July, I can't remember the exact date, and I wish I could because I'd go back and get the exact wording of what it was she said, but she made the comment that Canadians should be, Canadians should expect to live with the current inconveniences for the next two to three years. And when Pfizer came out only a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was 10 days ago, 12 days ago, with the announcement that their vaccine was being 90% effective based upon what they had. One of the first things Dr. Fauci down here was quoted as saying was that even if everything goes well with you know, the conclusion of this particular one, and Modera has come out since then and said roughly the same thing, that it's still going to be the end of 2021, maybe even the beginning of the following year before we begin to see some normalcy. Not before we're back to normal, but before we begin to see some normalcy. So, you know, for those of us involved in education, we really want to be thinking about what's happening now as also what's gonna be happening for the rest of this school year, what's gonna be happening for most, if not all of the next school year. You know, so we want to really get a, a good sense as to both things that are going great, because we want to try to replicate that in, in places. We also want to know things that we're still struggling with so that we can take a concerted look at how we can go about addressing these, because this is not going to be a short term thing. This is a long term issue that we're going to deal with. And, you know, the next two years or year and a half or year, however it is long, is just for this pandemic. Keep in mind that this is the fifth pandemic that we've had in this century. And we're only 20 years in. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and, and I think the other part too, because we're doing some work with uh, some of the indigenous communities in uh, Northern uh, parts of Canada. And it, it really is a long-term uh, uh, you know, view that needs to be taken uh, I really object to the term pivot. Uh, I think that there is none of this that's happening in K to 12. It, it takes a long time to build skill sets, to change pedagogical orientation, to change your mindsets. Uh, I know as a secondary science teacher going into an elementary uh, room, it, uh, it was a disaster for the first six months until I actually rethought my focus, my pedagogy, and then I had to learn new things and practice them. And it wasn't for two years until I actually considered myself to be a somewhat okay elementary teacher. Um, so this takes time. And so the focus around the stories are where it hits personally to me as well, so that we can tell some of the successes and see where it goes. But we really do have to have a long-term mindset here. This isn't something that's just gonna turn uh, and we're not gonna turn our education approach uh, that instantly. So I think we're gonna wander into some discussion. Joel, do you have anything that you wanna say before I, I uh, close off the recording? Yes, actually um, talking about that as a teacher's point of view is, is important. And um, one thing that is missing, I guess, from, the, from what um, was available for the jurisdictions is the, um, the teachers in terms of how they were being prepared to do both online and face-to-face -face, um, or continue 
um, with a whole class specifically face to, um, sorry, online. And there was not um, opportunities for, for teachers to have that professional development or professional learning opportunities. So they were just um, thrown into it in the spring and did the best that they could. And I think that they did a really good um, job considering all things, but then coming into face-to-face um, -face and then having to as well do synchronous for your online is, um, is such a challenge. And as a teacher, I'm, it's, I still don't know <laughs> what the solution are because it's so challenging, especially not having um, the knowledge or education about what is online learning? How is it different than face-to-face? -face? What are the different things we have to consider pedagogically um, to make sure that our students are still having really important um, learning opportunities going on? Yeah, and I think one of the insights that, that I, and I argue for this, um, and I did see it with, I was teaching, uh, working with teachers, in one of the courses at Vancouver Island University in, in May and June when they were going back into the schools, uh, literally. And so some elementary teachers were trying to figure out how they're going to manage that uh, because they'd already been posting things online and putting some work there. And I said, well, why would you stop? Why would you prepare for kids at home? And then for the kids that come into the school, why would you prepare something different? Now you're doing two different teaching jobs. And I think there's still some teachers that find themselves in that. And I know at the very least that as long as there is accessibility to online platforms and spaces, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, the learning management systems, or something of that nature where you can localize where your, your course and class materials, uh, where the videos and other supplementary resources, if you organize them in those digital online spaces, it doesn't matter where the student is for accessing them. And when you do that, it flips what you do. And, and when kids come into a, a classroom and a group, you create groups, create interactivity, social learning, project-based things, and the communication flow is different. And then you have to figure out how you're gonna do that online. But I see some very successful teachers and actually one of them, it was Trevor McKenzie, who's uh, very much into inquiry. Uh, and you may have heard of him. He's um, known, he was, walked us into his, his, his classroom. He's a, teaching science in a, a secondary school, but he talked about how he has got project pieces working in there. He floats around with the students, but he's also working with them online. So he's got students that are online with him at the same time. So very highly interactive uh, in terms of that, but project-based. So I think there's some pedagogical things that can come from this. We want to get those mm -hmm. stories we want to share those stories. So I think that's what we're looking forward to. And it's just not a one-shot deal. It's not all gonna be out there for December the 4th. It's gonna be an ongoing dialogue, I think that we have as well. So let's, uh, let me say thanks to those who are watching the archive uh, and we're gonna turn it off. We're gonna move into some discussion and, and uh, go from there.